God bless you all, and welcome to the Sons and Daughters of Encouragement Daily Bible Study. As always, it's a joy and a privilege to bring the word to you today and to share this time in fellowship and in teaching, encouragement, admonishment, exhortation. It's all here. So we're glad you're here. We're going through the book of Acts. We are in chapter 21. We're going to start in verse 1. And by this point, Paul um, has gone through all three of his missionary journeys. He's actually coming back from the end of the third missionary journey. And he's been having all these warnings from the Holy Spirit that chains and afflictions await him in Jerusalem, which is where he's headed. So we're going to see what happens here as he makes his way over to Jerusalem. And let's pray and let's get into the word. Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity, this moment in time to come before you in prayer, in fellowship, and with open ears and open hearts and open minds and open eyes. So please, God, if we don't have any of those things open, please help us do that right now before we receive the word. And God, please let me speak your words, not my own. And God, I just pray that you would own this Bible study today. In Jesus' name, thank you so much, God. Amen. All right, family. Here we are in chapter 21, starting in verse 1 in the book of Acts. After we tore ourselves away from them, we set sail straight for Kaz, the next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patara. Finding a ship crossing over to Phoenicia, we boarded and set sail. After we sighted Cyprus, passing to the south of it, we sailed on to Syria and arrived at Tyre, since the ship was to unload its cargo there. We sought out the disciples and stayed there seven days. Let's stop right in the middle of verse four. And I'm going to just show you what this is all about here. So here's our map. And then on the bottom left in the key, you can see that it says conformingtojesus.com. That's the source of this map. This is Paul's third missionary journey. On the right-hand side in Syria, the red line starts in that city called Antioch. Well, Paul started there and made his way all the way through, all the way to Corinth on the very left side of the screen, at which point he started going back the way he came. And where we left at the end of chapter 20 was go to the middle of the screen where it says Lycia, the little brown region there, and go west and a touch north, just a touch. And there's a place called Miletus. That's where we left off yesterday. So he just had an exhortation to the Ephesian elders, and they had many, many tears because Paul said he would never see them again. This was a very sensitive moment. This was very, it's hard, man. It's hard to say goodbye. You know, we don't want to do it because we love people. We love people. Um, you know, it's, it's more meaningful to experience life with, with your brothers and sisters and, and, you know, blood family and church family, although we are blood family by the blood of Christ. Amen. But that being the case, the first verse of 21 says, after we tore ourselves away from them, that's who they're speaking of, the Ephesian elders. They literally had to, to just do it, man, and leave. They had to tear themselves away. It was, it was a hard day. Well, it says we set sail, uh, sail straight for Kaz. So you can see there a little bit south of Miletus, the island there, Kaz. Then they went to Rhodes, and then they went to Patara, which is there on the south coast of Lycia. And it says that at that moment, they found a ship crossing over to Phoenicia, which is all the way on the right side of the screen, about three quarters of the way down that whole region of Phoenicia, all those coastal cities there. So, you know, let's not miss this. They were set, they set sail for those three areas, the two islands and then that coastal city in Lycia in the middle of the screen. And then they had to find a ship going to Phoenicia. They had a destination and they needed to get there. So rather than delay themselves, Sometimes when we're in one vessel to get somewhere in our lives, sometimes we have to exit that vessel and find a new vessel that's going straight to our destination. This is just the way it is sometimes. 
this can express itself in many ways. And I would encourage you to look at your own circumstances in your life and see how that might speak to you. Um, I am not telling anyone to jump ship on anything. What I am saying is sometimes we may need to recognize that it's time to switch vessels. That being the case, pray on that. If that speaks to you somehow, pray. Don't make any rash decisions. Just pray on it. Let the spirit guide. That being the case, uh, in verse 3, then they, you know, they set sail at the end of verse 2. Then they sighted Cyprus, that island there in, um, you know, southeast of Lycia, that coastal city of Patara. There's that island of Cyprus. Well, this is where Barnabas was born. This was where John Mark, who wrote the Gospel of Mark, he was a cousin of Barnabas, so potentially came from that same, that same area. Well, they didn't stop there this time. They passed by it. And they went down and wound up at Tyre. And so it says, we sailed on to Syria, arrived at Tyre since the ship was to unload its cargo. So they made it as close as they could. Remember, they're heading to Jerusalem. And so they, the ship unloaded. So they had to you know, get out of that vessel as well. And what's the first thing they did? They sought out the disciples and they stayed seven days. So the first thing they did after this journey is coming to its completion, they found the brethren and they stayed with them for seven days. So sometimes when we are coming to the end of some sort of journey we're in, we need to seek out that fellowship. I, in fact, I said sometimes, I would argue every time, we need to seek out that fellowship among each other and to, to be surrounded by brothers who will tell us true counsel. And when I say true counsel, I mean the counsel of God, the word of God, people who will speak that the Holy Spirit is speaking through them because they're speaking the truth of the Word of God. That being the case, at the end, the four, uh, verse 4b, the second part, it says, through the Spirit, they told Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Wow, so that he's in the fellowship. All these people, his disciples, there, his brethren, and they're through the Spirit saying, don't go there. Don't go to Jerusalem. Well, look, we're going to see a little bit later in this chapter that the Spirit is, is guiding him this way. This is God's will. However, we might see a contradiction there. It says, through the Spirit, they told Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Well, rather than wait until I get to the other verse and then give away the, the, the section here, in this part B of verse 4, we can gather... It's not specifically stated in the Bible, but we can gather that a possibility is that the Spirit told them Paul's going to encounter imprisonment, uh, opposition, eventually leading to some very dire circumstances for Paul, which eventually leads to his execution in the long run. So they may be trying to compel him not to go because of the information the Holy Spirit provided them. It doesn't necessarily mean the Holy Spirit told them to tell Paul not to go there. We don't want to miss that. So we, we just can interpret that, that it's, it's very likely through the Spirit informing them of what would happen to Paul, they tried to compel him not to go because we're human. We're human and we don't want them to be in that suffering. Well, at any rate, in verse 5, it says, When our time had come to an end, the time with us, those seven disciples in Tyre, or, I'm sorry, the time with the disciples when they were there for seven days. My apologies. It says, um, while, when our time had come to an end, we left to continue our journey, trying to get to Jerusalem. We got to go. While all of them, all of the disciples, with their wives and children, it was a family event. Church is always designed to be a family environment as far as the actual meeting of church, the gatherings of church to hear the word of God, to, to be um, ex, uh, edified, to be strengthened, to be taught. Um, this is always a family experience. We want to be together. Um, well, it says with their wives and children, and they accompanied them out of the city. So when we have a deliverance in our life, when we are on a further mission, and we have sought counsel from our brethren, we then travel as a pack. We stay in the middle of the pack, 
And in this case, we can be as impactful for the kingdom as possible. And all of our families, we all strengthen each other. Amen? So he says, accompanied us out of the city. After kneeling down on the beach to pray, they're on this coastal city of Tyre. They knelt down on the beach all together. Men, wives, children, everybody is kneeling and praying. Must have been a beautiful moment in public. We can pray in public. Amen. We can go to the beach. In here in this country, we can go to the beach. We can get on our knees and we can lift our hands. Uh, levanto mis manos, right? I lift my hands. Uh, aunque no tengo, ne, no tenga fuerzas. When, when, when they don't even have strength. Levanto mis manos, lift my hands. I lift my hands. Cuando tenga mil problemas, when I have a thousand problems, you say, I lift my hands. Well, Paul's got a lot of problems awaiting him in Jerusalem, but they, they lift their hands in prayer. It doesn't say they lifted their hands, but they knelt down on the beach. You know, I'm sure there were some hands lifted high to, to, the, to the Lord, right? And, and they felt, uh, comienza a sentir, uh, they, they felt... Um, the, the song, they felt an, an anointing that brought song to them. You know, that I'm quoting lyrics, by the way, from a song. Uh, it's a, a, a Spanish worship song, Levanto Mis Manos, I Lift My Hands. And he says, I lift my hands when I'm anointed um, to, to be brought to song. You're anointing me to be brought to song when I lift my hands. And it says, when I lift my hands, I begin to feel the fire. God's fire. So, so this is what's happening. We're coming together in unity to send Paul off to this very difficult place. And it says, we said farewell to one another and boarded the ship and they returned home. So everybody went back home. Paul continued his journey. And remember, it says we, we uh, boarded the ship, right? We said farewell and they returned home. So this is Luke writing the book of Acts. So Luke is currently with Paul and the group as they've been traveling. And so it says in verse 7, chapter 21, the book of Acts, when we completed our voyage from Tyre, re we reached Ptolemy. So you can see it's a little bit south of Tyre on the bottom right-hand side, the coastal area of Phoenicia, where we greeted the brothers and sisters and stayed with them for one day. So one day. The next day we left and came to Caesarea, right there, a little bit closer to Jerusalem, where we entered the house of Philip, the evangelist. And it says, who was one of the seven and stayed with him. We stayed with Philip. Hey, we remember Philip. Philip was one of the seven deacons who were originally chosen and the people laid hands on them. They were designated to minister to the, the physical needs of the people and, and to minister to the widows and things like that. They were to do that so that the apostles could continue dedicating themselves to prayer and to teaching and preaching. So we all have different roles in the kingdom of God. Amen? You've got a role in the kingdom of God. So it says, Philip was one of those seven, and he's an evangelist. He's going out and speaking the word of God. Praise God. Well, this is the only other time we hear of Philip. He's the one who helped that uh, eunuch, uh, the Ethiopian eunuch in Samaria, if you recall. The guy was just rolling along on his cart after leaving all the festivities, and, and he's like, I don't, how can I understand this scripture? It was Isaiah 53, I think. He says, how can I understand this? And if no one teaches me, so we, we're going to be ready in season and out of season. Well, it says this man, Philip, had four virgin daughters who prophesied. Doesn't say what their specific prophecies were. So why is verse nine mentioned? Well, I can't tell you why, but I can tell you that because this verse is mentioned, it gives us information that, you know, men and women can, can prophesy, can have that spiritual gift of prophecy. And so we always want to remember that although women were created as man's helper, they were suitable together, right? Men and women share in, in the responsibilities of, of, of ministering and serving for the Lord. And so these women had the ability, the spiritual gift rather, to prophesy. So I, you know, 
I don't know why it's specifically what's going on there, except what we can glean from it in respect to the inclusivity of the body of Christ. It is not a patriarchal, I'm the man and I do everything. It is an ex, uh, inclusive. That being the case, verse 10, after we had been there for several days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. We know Agabus. He was in chapter 11. Well, in chapter 11 of this book of Acts, verse 28, Agabus prophesied that there would be a famine, and it was very helpful information. Well, here he is again, and he came down from Judea. He came to us, excuse me, and took Paul's belt. It was not uncommon for a prophet to use a physical means of giving God's information. I think it was Jeremiah. I can't remember. Somebody ran around naked for a while. Right? It was all, you know, a physical external display of God's crucial information that the prophet was receiving from God. So it says he came to us, took Paul's belt, tied his own feet and hands. He bound himself, Agabus, and said, this is what the Holy Spirit says. In this way, the Jews in Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him over to the Gentiles. Well, that's direct information for Paul. When we heard this, verse 12, both we and the local people pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. This is the first time we hear even Luke, even Luke's concern, because he doesn't say, when we heard of this, the local people pleaded. It says both we me, I am a part of we, both we and the local people pleaded with him. They're begging him, Paul, don't go. Every single direction and, and prophecy is pointing you what's going to happen there. Listen to Paul's reply in verse 13. Then Paul replied, what are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart. For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Since he would not be persuaded, we said no more except the Lord's will be done. We're going to stop there. That was verse 14, book of Acts chapter 21. So Paul, as they're pleading with him, because they know he's going to be delivered to the Gentiles, and they, it's chains, it's affliction. Paul's like, why are you tugging on me? I have to go. This is my mission. I'm going to fulfill my mission. Fight the good fight and finish the race with endurance. And he says, I'm ready not only to be bound, but to die in Jerusalem. Well, that is an example of what Jesus did. Because he, you know, Peter told Jesus at one point, um, you won't die. Don't say that. He rebuked the Lord. <laughs> Have you ever rebuked the Lord? No, God, that's not the right plan. Yeah, amen. I'll speak for myself. Well, listen. Peter told Jesus, you, you can't do that, which sounded much like what Satan, the old serpent, said in the Garden of Eden. When Eve said, if we eat of this fruit, we cannot even touch it, which is not exactly what God said, but that's another study. He said, for the day we eat of it, we will surely die. And what was Satan's response? That old serpent in the Garden of Eden, you will not die. You shall not die. Well, this is the same thing Peter is telling Jesus. You can't die. Don't say that. And so my son all the time says, don't say that. I can just imagine Peter going, don't say that. Well, Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. Wow. Whoopsies. Foot in mouth. Well, here's, here's the people saying, you can't do this. Don't do that. Don't, do, don't say that. <laughs> don't leave. Don't do this. And Paul's like, are you kidding me, man? I have to. This is my mission. I will die in Jerusalem. 
Well, now remember, Peter also said, I'll die for you, Lord. And look what happened there. He ate his words. However, when Jesus returned, when he uh, resurrected and saw Peter, he gave him, remember, Peter denied him three times. He gave him three um, questions and answers. Do you love me? Then feed my sheep. Do you love me? Then take care of my sheep. Do you love me? Then feed my sheep. And he gave Peter the chance to redeem his living work for the Lord. Peter's already saved. And I'm not talking about redeeming him in salvation. He gave him a chance to redeem his presence in the kingdom on earth now to work unto the Lord, to labor in a fruitful way that God loves for the Lord, for God. Well, that's here is, is Paul saying, and Peter did die for the Lord at the end of his road. He, he, it came true. What he said came true. You know, it's, it's church tradition, the, the way he was crucified upside down. Peter did die for the Lord just after he said he would. That being the case, Paul is ready to do the same, right? And Paul said, I will die for the Lord. And so they say a very interesting thing. Remember, I told you in that previous verse earlier, it said, through the spirit, they told him not to go to Jerusalem. Well, here they are at the end of this section in verse 14 saying, but nonetheless, God's will be done. Wow. So it, it is God's will. It was God's will for Peter to, I mean, I'm sorry, for Paul to continue this journey and go to Jerusalem and face this imprisonment and this affliction that he's about to have. <coughs> Excuse me. So that should be our prayer. God's will be done. Okay, but we need brethren around us to help us see what God's will is, to help us hear a voice outside of our own voice. We need to be in prayer, sometimes fasting and prayer. We need to be in fellowship with believers, learning the word, disciple. We need to be being discipled and discipling others. Well, this is all part of, part of the thing here. So grateful to spend this time with you in Jesus' name. Have a great day. Hopefully I'll see you at church. God bless you all. Take care.